when I first got interested in, in AM radio, um, uh, I got my first license a novice when I was 11, but eventually I got a general class license. And when I was in freshman in high school, we had this unusual radio. It belonged to one of the uh, Jesuit priests. I went to a Jesuit high school and we had a ham club there and uh, it had this this little bitty transmitter that you had to plug coils in to change bands. It was it was a Central Electronics 10A. I never heard of one before. Um, all the radios that I were aware of all had all used a filter scheme uh, for generating single sideband. And I was interested in in anything that was electronics. I would just take stuff apart. The set didn't work one day, so I'm poking around in it. Say, well, this is an unusual single sideband transmitter because it doesn't have a filter in it. So how does it work? I never heard of the phasing principle yet. <laughs> so that took me some time to figure out how it did work. Um, we needed to get coils to operate on different bands because we only had coils that operated on uh, 80 meters and, and um, 40. So to operate the set, you had to lift the lid up plug the mixer coil and the PA, the final amplifier coil in, and then you're ready to go in one band. But I wanted to operate on 20, and so did the rest of the guys. So I said, well, um, this, um, this central electronics company, we did some research in QSD because they were out of business, found out it was part of Zenith. So I sent them a letter. I mean, I'm just a kid, in, a freshman in high school. So I'm writing this, this big radio company that has God knows how many people working for it <clears throat> about this little bitty transmitter they don't make anymore. Well, lo and behold, I get a letter back and it's from Carl Hassel. Well, at first I didn't know who Carl Hassel was. It turns out that Carl Hassel founded Zenith Radio. <laughs> so he sends a letter back to this high school kid um, explaining how to build the little coils that go into the 10A transmitter. And he said, oh, by the way, you might want to talk to the fellow or send a letter to the fellow that invented it. And his gave me his name. His name was Wes Shum. I'd never heard of Wes Shum, really. But in any event, that's how I eventually became acquainted with Wes. First by sending him letters, later by telephone. And finally, um, in 1984, I went to Chicago and met him for the first time. Uh, during this period, I was trying to uh, go into college. Um, ham radio was instrumental in me wanting to become electrical engineer. So I uh, enrolled in college, got my degree in electrical engineering, and wanted to build the output networks that were famous in the central electronics radios. And uh, that's how I really started to get close with Wes and we became more than as telephone pen pals. We actually got to meet each other and, and became fast friends. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, Wes Shum and his involvement in the uh, development of single sideband for the amateur radio service. Many people are wondering, well, who is this guy Shum and why is he so important? And, and what was his role in all of this? Because if you ask anybody about single sideband, ask them, well, who in, who brought single sideband to ham radio, the first person they talk about is Art Collins. That's not exactly the way it worked. Um, and um, yeah, I think you'll, you'll find the, the rest of the story pretty interesting. You know, before there was sideband, it was just a mess on the bands. You would get on 20, 80 or 20 meters and the band was, was loaded with heterodynes from all the guys trying to operate AM and only the strong signals got through. If you were a little pipsqueak, you just got smashed like a grape. And I guess this is how the, um, uh, the term California kilowatt got to be invented. He got started in radio about the same time, I guess, I did, about 11 years old. He was born in 1921. So he really uh, was, was involved in the the, um, the Depression years and World War II. But as a young kid, um, you know, radio was just a hot thing. It's kind of like uh, what the internet is today and robotics are for young people today. Radio had that kind of um, uh, draw with young people uh, back in the 20s. Uh, 
and he wanted to build radios and he experimented a lot. Of course, he didn't realize he needed to have a license, but he and his a uh, couple of his friends built a, a communication system that operated really above the two meter band. And they were talking to each other across town, didn't understand that they needed a license at all. <laughs> but eventually they did get one. But uh, his interest in radio continued to grow. And if you lived in Chicago in that period, of course, there were a number of radio manufacturers in the city. And uh, Wes would, would gravitate to the E.H. Scott factory. And he would hang, um, hang himself by his fingers looking in the window uh, down into factory floor and was just fascinated with all the material and equipment and goings on. Finally, one of the shop foremen noticed him and brought him in. And um, he was, the bug was really embedded at that point. I mean, he, he figured this is what he needed to do in life. And electronics became his big thing. Certainly in World War II, he was very active in building uh, equipment that was designed by, uh, for example, MIT, the radiation lab, was working on radar. And the company he was involved with uh, built uh, frequency meters uh, that were initially designed by MIT, uh, but manufactured by companies like the one he was involved with, which was the Cobra Dual Signal Company. His life was, was, <laughs> was full of contradictions. Here we are in World War II, and he was um, such an electronic whiz at that point in time. He was uh, recruited by a number of companies to work on products in the war effort in Chicago. So he got a deferment <clears throat> until the war ended. And then he was drafted and <laughs> brought in. Um, and he spent a couple of years in the service, got married, had, had a child on the way, but was introduced to the concept of single sideband. Because actually there was some single sideband used by um, AT&T during World War II for the transmission of information between the United States and Europe. So he was um, in, in the section that he was involved with, which was uh, counterintelligence, um, he learned about um, single sideband and other techniques that were being used by the, the military. And he figured, well, this would have application for amateur operators in the future. So he was very, very uh, interested and, and tried to learn everything he could about it. You know, and he saw that as an opportunity. He wanted to get rid of the heterodynes that was so prevalent on AM communications and made it such a hassle to operate phone. I guess that's primarily why so many people stayed on CW. Now, after the war, 1948 is probably the key year for amateur uh, uh, experimentation with single sideband. It just exploded and it was um, uh, well documented by QST and also CQ magazine. Uh, during the years of 1948 and 49. And in fact, it seemed like both, both extremes of the United States were working on it. There were guys at Stanford University uh, working on single sideband experiments. At the same time, hams involved with General Electric in, in Syracuse, New York, were likewise experimenting, uh, experimenting with, with single sideband. General Electric wanted to get into it uh, in a big way in the commercial side. The guys over at Stanford were looking to do it uh, with respect to bringing it to amateur radio. But a, an article was, was eventually published by a fellow named Don Norgard, W2KUJ, who um, talked about how you could utilize single sideband practical methods for receiving it and in a publication called the uh, GE Ham News, he published a very inexpensive, simple uh, phasing type single sideband exciter that you could use on 80 meters. <clears throat> and that really kind of got some people thinking, well, here it was, it wasn't as, as expensive uh, and difficult as, as the systems that AT&T was, was utilizing for for commercial telephony, uh, this was something that you could actually homebrew in your shack and, and utilize it on, on the bands. This is a picture of the first um, viable single sideband exciter 
that uh, people could build at home. It's called the Single Sideband Junior. Uh, it was by uh, General Electric in their GE Ham News in their November, December 1950 issue. <clears throat> well, Weshum had been experimenting with single sideband transmitters too in this period. He was trying to do it with filters utilizing surplus um, 455 kilohertz crystals that were used in, in uh, communication sets for tanks in World War II. That was um, one way in which you could build a, a selective filter to eliminate one of the two sidebands in an AM signal. The only problem with that is there was no ready supply of crystals. If you were trying to build these things as a product, um, crystals were expensive back then, uh, especially getting the types that you would need to make a lattice filter. So uh, this, this concept that Norgard had presented using a phasing principle, which is a math mathematic way of generating single sideband, appealed to him because it used nothing more than resistors and capacitors didn't require the use of, of specialized crystals to make a filter. At that time, of course, uh, Collins had not uh, perfected uh, its mechanical filter. So that really wasn't an option either at that point in time. The only problem with the single sideband junior was it only operated in one band. And if you move frequency, all these little adjustments on the front, you see these adjustable coils in the front, you would have to readjust them to suppress the, the um, uh, unwanted sideband. So it was a tedious thing if you tried to move QSY um, even in the same band if you're operating on 75 meters. This is why most of the discussions at 75 uh, in the early days were in the very high end of the band. For one, they wouldn't interfere as much with the AM AMers because the AM guys really didn't appreciate single sideband at all. It sounded horrible on the AM receiver. And uh, also, it, um, uh, the guys wouldn't have to move frequency. They would just operate fixed frequency with a crystal. Like this one has a single uh, little crystal in front. Now these exciters only ran about five watts. And the idea was to uh, drive a, a, a grid-driven amplifier, a linear amplifier that you would homebrew as well. Well, Wes got the idea, well, you know, <clears throat> Collins had come out with the 75A1 receiver, which used a heterodyning principle to get it to, to tune on different bands. So you had a, a set of crystals that you would and mix, and, and that way you could operate this, the thing in a set IF on different frequency bands. And he thought, well, why couldn't we do the same thing with this single sideband exciter? Why can't we operate it at a fre fixed frequency with a a mixing scheme and even connect a VFO to it. And get tuned. This happens to be a picture of Wes. You probably, many of y'all may not remember Wes at all. Some of you might, you know, some of you guys are probably from the same era as I am or before, and uh, you would have heard of Central Electronics as company. But anyway, this is Wes uh, in the factory that Zenith Radio operated in the in the, the period of 1959 to 61. So he took Don Norgard's design and made it tunable. So you wouldn't have to retune the thing every time you QSY to a different frequency. That was Wes Shum that did that. Oh, by the way, you know, um, Norgard also developed this, this uh, method of, of detecting single sideband. It's one thing to transmit it, you still had to receive it. So he built a system. And um, Wes, of course, built a system around uh, Norgard's designs and marketed it. It was called the 10A. It was first in, uh, developed, or it was developed in 1951. Now, this is a picture of the 10A. And um, it was a very simple rig, it operated um, uh, a single six eight, uh, AG7 final about 10 watts peak uh, power, which was enough to drive a, a linear amplifier of the day. And it, uh, it would do upper and lower single sideband. Also, it could do AM. And even um, because it used the phasing principle, you could operate uh, phase modulation uh, on 10 meters with it. 
what they did or what West did was he generated the single sideband energy at nine megahertz. So as a fixed frequency, it included box. Now, I don't know of very many transmitters back in 1950, 51, that had a voice operated or voice controlled system uh, for push to talk, but the uh, 10A did. It also had a QT. Well, I guess that was to keep it on the QT, but we call that today anti-box. That was built into the, the 10A. And he sold it along with a, the demodulator and either kit or wired form, and it sold like crazy. Now he started his business in the garage behind his parents' house. And eventually as it kept growing, he kept by uh, renting uh, garages in the neighborhood because they all served by a back alley. So pretty soon he had six different garages with a service alley and he was using uh, technicians and kids they recruited from the DeVry Institute Technical School to help build these things. So suddenly this neighborhood has got these kids running up and down the service alley with wheelbarrows moving transformers and steel and, and, and cabinets and chassis and all this stuff. And it, it became a full blown radio manufacturing operation in a residential area. Eventually it had to move, of course. Now, you know, Wes had acquired uh, the rights to, to utilize the General Electric's patent and that, that design, uh, the single sideband junior was actually protected by a patent. He got um, a permission to do that. And the first exciter that he built, the, the prototype was in April of 51. Here's a picture of it. Now, if you look at this picture and we'll go back a couple of slides, you'll see that there's pretty good correlation between the two. They look very similar. This is an inside shot of it. Central Electronics and was off to the races. They were building these sets like crazy. They had advertised in CQ Magazine and QST. Uh, people wanted to get on this single sideband mode, experiment with it, at least a lot of people did. And so they were selling these kits like crazy. But, you know, um, People were getting a little bit tired by 1954 of having to open the lid and change coils in order to change bands. So eventually, um, uh, the improved version, which is the Model 20A, was all band switched. So you no longer had to have plug-in coils. You would just switch the band and tune it up, and you're ready to go. It even had a little uh, magic eye tube, so you could uh, either null out the carrier, or you could use it as a a uh, peak power indicator so you could tune the thing up correctly. So he has effectively refined the 10A concept into a device that was more universally acceptable to hands, the 20A. They sold a gajillion of those, probably about 7,500 is the total number of those sets they made. Now you have to figure back in the mid 1950s, there probably were only about 70,000 amateur radio operators. So uh, he sold a considerable number of these things to hams at that time. Now this was pretty neat and it got people on single sideband. Single sideband unfortunately did cause a lot of friction with AM operators. They didn't like it because it sounded horrible on the AM detected, uh, a diode detector receiver and you couldn't understand it. It sounded like Donald Duck. And a lot of folks complained that the sideband signals were wide. It was because of the receivers that were in vogue at that time. They didn't have the selectivity that you could take advantage of a single sideband signal that was only three kilohertz wide. You had these receivers that had a, 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 a um, detector bandwidth that was more in the order of 12 kilohertz. So yeah, of course it sounded bad. It sounded uh, a sideband signal could sound a much wider than it really was. But it just caused a lot of controversy. The hams were, uh, many hams wrote the QST letters to the editors, which you can, I have some of them published in our book uh, that are quite amusing today. If you look back at it, that uh, they were afraid that single sideband was gonna completely make all their equipment worthless. What were they going to do? It was horrible, um, but it turned out to be the right thing to do.
for lots of reasons. Central Electronics, so Wes's company is, is famous for the no tune concept. You know, today you buy a radio and there's no plate in uh, tuning or loading controls. Uh, all you do is turn the big knob in the middle and so you hear somebody that interests you, you grab the microphone button or the key and you send and it's all ready to go. That wasn't the way it was back in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, a ham had to do a lot of, uh, had to understand radio technology and how to tune a transmitter up correctly so he didn't blow his files up in his transmitter and actually got power out. You know, back in 53, 54, this fellow Joe Batchelor, who was a ham that lived in the sticks in Georgia, uh, he, he was a brilliant guy. This is Mensa, his IQ was off the chart. He was thinking, and also a very active ham, and he was thinking, you know, there's got to be a way around this, this plate and load stuff. And he invented a, a output coupling network that would match, automatically match the high impedance of a, a uh, transmitting tube to the low impedance of an antenna circuit, a, a transmission line. And it did away with the tune and load controls. So he had a meeting with uh, Wes at a ham fest in Chicago and said, you know, I've got these, uh, these different things I'm working on um, that are going to revolutionary, uh, revolutionary to ham radio. Are you interested in it? And Wes, you know, he was, <laughs> he was always interested in something new. He said, yeah, I'm interested in it. Why don't we talk about it? And eventually those two got together and um, uh, Bachelor was brought into the central electronics uh, sphere. Together, they started designing a broadband amplifier to go with these little um, five and 10 watt exciters that they had built. And the neat thing about this amplifier was it was going to require no tuning. It was going to utilize this, this design that Bachelor had invented. It used, um, uh, it had uh, degenerative band switch feedback uh, on, the, on the tube so that it was automatically neutralized band to band. It had a step start circuit to limit the inrush current in the amplifier when you first turned it on. Now, step start circuits are pretty normal and common in tube type amplifiers today, but they didn't exist back then. This was the first amplifier to use one for amateur purposes. The other neat thing was because it didn't have a plate and loading tuning control, all it had was a band switch and a meter switch. The meter switch just allowed you to check SWR. It had a built-in SWR bridge. Watts input. Back then, you had to calculate what your input power was in your transmitter to be legal with the FCC. <clears throat> Central Electronics did it for you automatically by having the uh, panel meter in the front scaled appropriately for the input power. So you just had to look at the, the, the meter and you know how much power it was running. And it also had a, a way of measuring RF antenna current let you know how efficient uh, your matching system was for the antenna. It had front panel alarm indicators. It was designed to, for use with a TR switch, electronic TR switch or relay uh, for antenna switching. It had a unique um, uh, screen um, regulator circuit built into it. It was so unique, uh, it was designed by a fellow that was working for Wes at the time. His name was Tom Clements, W9OKA. And um, it was such a neat idea that uh, if you look in issues of uh, the ARRL handbook from about 1958, 59, 60, 61, you'll see Tom's uh, screen circuit in the handbook, which is kind of neat. Um, and he used a single A13. The way that the tube was protected, you really couldn't destroy it. Uh, it, it in fact, some of the, the 600 L's that I restore from people have the original A13 in it from back when it was built in the 50s. It's amazing. They're great tubes. Now, the picture on the left is the 600L. And as I said, it had a meter switch on the left, the band switch on the right, the meter in the middle, <clears throat> and the uh, status indicators under the meter. The one on the left is just the filament it's on. Uh, the one on the right, the red one, is the high voltage when you where it does hit the switch and it's, it's ready to transmit. 
The one in the middle is an alarm, a fault indication. So if you had uh, excessively high SWR or you were overdriving the amplifier, uh, that light would light up. <clears throat> the amplifier would trip itself out to protect itself. So you couldn't, you couldn't damage a 600L. The set on the right is the 100V broadband transmitter. And this is the one that really changed ham radio. <clears throat> now, they started developing it in 1955. It was going to be completely self-contained. 100 watts uh, output, continuous duty at its own power supply. and handled all the modes, sideband, double sideband uh, with suppressed carrier, AM, phase modulation, and even included frequency keying. Teletype was starting to become a um, active mode in ham radio in the in the 50s. So they built uh, an FSK um, 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 mode into the transmitter. So it was ready for teletype back then. It had an active filter. And this is really neat because it used um, a um, there were two modules in it. The uh, processor part uses a the combined uh, triode and pentode stage. And the active filter is likewise a triode and pentode. It has an unbelievably sharp cutoff. Um, you know, the, the, the band pass on the, two, the 100V was designed to start rolling off at about 30, well, to roll off at 3,500. Um, it was at 40 decibels, almost 50 decibels down at 4,000. I mean, it was extremely steep sided. Uh, and this was done with tubes, really ingenious. It had a built in uh, modulation scope, a uh, permeability tuned oscillator. Um, they used um, audiophile type tubes. I mean, today, audiophiles have driven the cost of these tubes up dramatically, but they were designed for low intermodular distortion products. Um, six. Uh, Q5 driver and a pair of 6550 uh, tubes in the output stage made by Tungsol. Those Tungsol tubes likewise were extremely rugged because I've been restoring sets. Some of these tubes are close to 50 years old and they're still developed full output at 10 meters. It's just incredible. They just didn't wear out. Um, break in CW, FSK for ready. It's really a, a, a neat thing. The other thing that was interesting is that um, because it had um, no tuning and a very complex band switch, Wes got the idea, you know, guys keep blowing their transmitters up because they turn the band switch while, it's, while they're actually transmitting. So he fixed his so that you can turn that band switch and as you're rotating it, so it cuts everything off as you're switching from band to band. So one of the things that he would do with a, a seminar or a trade show, so you'd have 100V putting 100 watts into a dummy load, a watt meter, and then start turning the band switch from 80 to 10 meters and keep rotating it. And all it would do is the, the power would drop out and come back up, out, up, up, down, up, down. Didn't damage a thing. That really got everybody's attention. <laughs> now, back in the 50s, single sideband was a real big deal. Um, we started having these sideband dinners, principally up in New York, but I imagine they had them out on the West Coast too, uh, except that the only photographs I had gotten from Wes were for some of these sideband dinners that were held uh, in New York in which he attended. If you look real closely, you'll find him buried in here. But um, you notice one thing is that everybody dressed up for these events. I mean, when was the last time you saw anybody dressed up in a coat and tie to go to a ham fest? You know, it just didn't ha doesn't happen today. <laughs> You're lucky if you got a good clean T-shirt on. But uh, that's the way these folks uh, attended these events. And they were really big time events. A lot of big speakers that were the movers and, and shakers in this new technology uh, called single sideband. This is a picture of Wes and Joe Battler. Wes really sold hams on single sideband. And he did it the old fashioned way. He went to different trade shows, ham fests. And back then, you didn't have nearly as many ham fests then as you did today. But he did over 110 uh, ham fests and conventions 
promoting single sideband, providing technical seminars like this. And you can tell this is a kind of a, a uh, an early one because um, using a, 10, a 20A, so uh, obviously the 100V exciter hadn't been built yet. He's got the 600L amplifier. He's got two light bulbs on top as dummy loads. Now I know if you were a, a uh, embryonic ham back in the early 60s, you had to have a, a light bulb dummy load. Well, I did. Back in, in the, I guess in the late 60s, you know, the sunspot cycle was building up really well. And as a fairly new ham, I thought, well, this is great. This must be like it's what it's like all the time, right? You can work people in 10 meters all night long. It was fabulous, you know? So one night I'm just in my little ham shack and I'm experimenting with my transmitter. I've got the dummy load, the light bulb on it, you know? And I'm playing around, I'm calling CQ, watching my little light bulb flashing. I stopped sending, somebody was answering me. <laughs> they, they heard my signal from the light bulb, you know, just incredible conditions. And that's, I guess we can look forward to that now the sunspot cycle's coming back. By 1958, um, uh, Wes had a problem and Joe both. <clears throat> they had developed this 100V. They uh, used all the money they were getting from selling 10B and 20 exciters to, to bootstrap their company and pay for the development. But they were burning through money fast. And the other thing that was happening was uh, they sold their equipment through dealers. Back then, of course, you didn't have FedEx and UPS that could get a radio to you, you know, within a couple of days. You know, back then you had to send it by, especially everything like a, 600L or 100V that weighs about 100 pounds, you had to send those things by railway express. You know, so it took over a week for it to get to a destination. So in order to, to bootstrap sales, um, Central and a lot of the other dealers uh, or manufacturers would sell through dealers. Well, the problem with selling through a dealer was you spent the money to build it, you shipped it out, the dealer had your product and you really didn't know when he was going to pay you. And that happened to Wes and Central. Uh, they got stuck with some, some of the dealers were very slow to pay. Few of the companies went out of business and you never saw his equipment again. So they had the losses on that end. And plus, you know, if you're, if you're building a product and you're having a discount at 25%, uh, to sell to a dealer, but then you have to sell and build many more of that same product to net the same money if you were trying to sell it directly. The problem, though, is that there's a saturation point in the ham radio market. You know, you can only sell so many 10B and 20A exciters to a, a fairly small hobby community. I mean, when you think about it, when I was a ham, I got licensed in 67 as a general class. They might have had 130,000 hands. I mean, that's not a very big um, pool in order to sell product to. So he, he eventually uh, had to find a noble sire to keep the company afloat and to build the 100B. It turned out to be Carl Hammond's radio. They came to the rescue. He demonstrated the radio, and that was how Zenith got in the ham radio business. Many people don't even know that Zenith was in the ham radio business, but they were. Now with Zenith's input, they started cranking out transmitters. They sold, they, they produced 1500 of these 100 Vs. Uh, the new design, which was a 200 V, which came out in, it was designed in the early part of 61. And they had a 500 unit production run of them. So it wasn't, there weren't very many 200 Vs. 200V was just an improvement over the 100V with, with better mixer tubes and solid state power. So <clears throat> Central was also working on a 100R receiver to match a transmitter. Joe Bachelor was working on a 2500L broadband amplifier, the big brother to the 600L. This thing had a tube that was probably about this big around and that long glass tube uh, made by Amperex. It was really a beautiful thing. I've got it actually uh, in my shop. Um, they also were developing a lower cost system, the 50V for the, uh, the V meaning it had a VFO, 
and the 50R for it being the receiver, a lower cost um, product for the ham market. But suddenly in November 1961, Zenith made the decision to get rid of the amateur radio business. Why? Zenith was kind of late bringing color televisions to market. They held back intentionally because they didn't want to build a product and sell it to people and folks not have programming to actually use a color TV. You know, there wasn't very much color broadcasting done in 1960. Soon, broadcasting started moving in that direction, and Zenith had designs on the shelf and started building color television. Towards the end of 1961, they saw where their t color TV sales were going to be in the order of about $250 million. Now, in 1960 dollars, if you look at that today, that was a substantial amount of money compared to the two and a half to three million dollars uh, worth of, of uh, ham radio sales, there were, it, it just didn't make sense. Um, they, you know, CE was working on, in fact, had a little CB radio package that they were going to market, which could have saved central electronics, at least uh, pushed it out much beyond um, 1962, which is when it was deactivated. But that never came to fruition either. So without warning, Central Electronics was suddenly QRT. West didn't have a job. Uh, he lost the business that he had developed. He lost his patents. He lost everything because Zenith wasn't going to sell it to him. They thought that eventually they might utilize the technology that Central had developed for the military market. But that never came to fruition either. You know, here you are um, you're in your early 40s and suddenly you don't have a business anymore. He was very disillusioned. He got, he, he just bailed out of ham radio. He just wasn't on the HF bands at all. But he recalibrated. He built himself back again and moved in a totally different market. High voltage test sets that were utilized by AT&T, Bell Labs, uh, Motorola, uh, ADC Corporation, Teletype Corporation. All those folks used his test equipment. And uh, during that time, you know, after I became uh, uh, more involved with Wes, I would actually go up to Chicago and uh, help him build this product. And uh, we would always combine these, these, uh, these excursions that I would make up with a ham fest. So <laughs> it was always fun. You know, we had a great time together. And he taught me how to build my own business, which uh, we can talk about a little later. But I wrote this book um, because he was such an important figure in the amateur radio uh, history. And so many people didn't know anything about him. I thought that was just a shame because his story is, I believe, so important today, uh, especially uh, for young people, that um, maybe if, um, if a young person read his story, and saw the type of adversity he worked himself through, worked through, and became a success in multiple levels, it would give them the encouragement to go on and try to, to, to chase their dreams and make them a reality too. He was um, certainly very instrumental in my life in helping uh, me build a, a very successful business, first in manufacturing uh, uh, equipment for the oil industry, then later, I moved into building uh, digital paging transmitters when paging was a, a business before cellular came in. And then later in my public safety work, um, communications work, you know, one person really can make a difference in a person's life. I was lucky to have Wes Shum in my life, uh, such an instrumental uh, person in the development and bringing single sideband uh, a mode that we all enjoy today to the amateur community. I felt that his story needed to be told. The balance of my work for the last 30 years has been designing radio systems for the public safety community and trying to make them no break, trying to anticipate what things can go wrong uh, and make a radio network just collapse in a calamity. The radio vendors, the equipment vendors built excellent equipment. Motorola, L3 Harris, 
PF Johnson Kenwood, they build radio systems or radio equipment, transmitters, receivers that, that work just, just flawlessly. Uh, they're software upgradable, so they really are uh, uh, obsolescent proof uh, to a large degree. What kills radio networks are damage to antennas, the lack of electricity, uh, a sustained electricity, clean power at the sites, and site-to-site -site connectivity. Large radio networks utilized by counties and cities operate with multiple radio towers <clears throat> that have to operate um, in synchronization with each other. And, and that requires uh, a secure, uh, non-commercial uh, backhaul connectivity, normally with microwave. If you design a radio system anticipating that it's going to have, have to sustain failures and continue to operate, you've done your work in making it reliable. And reliability is an investment. It's expensive. It's not cheap. But when you have to have radio systems that work in the worst of circumstances, when commercial services such as cellular telephone are off the air and public safety needs to be able to communicate immediately in the aftermath of some disaster, that's what you have to do. You have to plan for like what Donald Rumsfeld used to call the unknown unknowns. <laughs> that is my presentation on central electronics and single sideband. Um, it was difficult for Wes to convince some people that sideband was the, the way of the future. One of the funniest stories he told me was uh, he was uh, doing a presentation in Lithia, at Lithia Springs Hamfest in Georgia. And um, he completed his sideband demonstration. He had a very convincing one. He would have um, uh, a single sideband excited, two of them, and two VFOs. And he would be able to, and they would have on this, or one VFO that operate two sideband exciters. One was on upper sideband, one was on lower sideband. He could switch between the two, there was no interference. It was really neat, it worked great, you know, and demonstrated how effective it was. Well, after his presentation, these two big burly guys grabbed him underneath the arms, lifted him up, drug him out the outside and dangled him over Lithia Springs and said they were gonna immerse him in the springs until he gave up this idea of single sideband. Well, Lithia Springs is only about two feet wide and a foot deep. <laughs> when they did this. So he, they put him down and he dusted himself off, said, this is nonsense. You know, single sideband is the wave of the future. You have to conform and get with the program. They grabbed him and they kissed him. <laughs> and that was, that was the, just this typical West Jean. He was just a character and um, people loved him. 